Hey everybody, we're here with Tim. We're in the Flying Bison Brewing Company here in Buffalo, New York. So yeah, I almost said Ontario because I'm just so used to being there. Uh, well, we are the six. There you go. <laughs> um, how did you come up with your brewery's name? Uh, it was a complete accident. We were, the original partner and I were down in uh, Virginia shopping for tanks, one of which is at Redwood clad cold water storage tank. And that looks nice over there too. Formerly a uh, fermenter. So we were down looking at a small brewery that was expanding and uh, we went out and did a lot of, shall we say, research and development. And uh, we were staying at his brother-in-law's place, sleeping on the couches in the basement. And when, uh, in the morning when it was time to get up and go pitch an offer to the guy for his tanks, we uh, you know, he kind of rolled off the couch, fell on the floor, and he said something that I thought was funny. Um, it was something else completely that can't really stay on camera, but so that's what uh, so that's where we started with the name. And as we started looking around, uh, Buffalo had really rich aviation history, so flying bison kind of made sense. Buffalo flying. Ready? And uh, I know that you were the first brewery to open up in in Buffalo since the year. In before. modern times, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, can you tell me the history of the brewery since? Then? Uh, well, we started out here in this kind of warehouse building that has been anything from uh, a warehouse for Buick Motor Car Corporation to the area where we're standing right now. There's a rail car, or a train that used to run through the building. Um, and during World War II, it was used as a uh, parts warehouse for anything that was built in Buffalo and was going overseas. Then it was a grocery store plaza. And when we moved in, it was a bombed out grocery store plaza. So we started in here, uh, my partner Red and I uh, looked at the place, decided to rent it, uh, started uh, basic construction, and then unfortunately he was killed in a motorcycle accident. So the investors who were with us at the time said, let's keep going, and so with their support, we kept going. And uh, 11 years later, here we are. All right, so that answers the next question of how long you've been in business. 11 years. Uh, <laughs> how many employees do you have? Uh, there's four of us here all together, um, and uh, we've grown that from zero jobs to, originally there was, there was just me as the working guy here, um, not getting paid, of course, and uh, you know, every brewer starts out not getting paid. So it's a warning to all you aspiring brewers out there, you'll start out not getting paid. Uh, but everybody's kind of come on one at a time, and they come in and, and kind of work as an internship capacity, and they prove themselves so valuable that we have to hire them on as a part-timer, and then we have to expand that, hire them on as a full-timer as the business grows. So it's actually been through the help of the employees that we've really been able to grow the business, and through their interest in the real, uh, the real fire to work in a brewery and work in the brewing industry. Alrighty, and how many styles of beer do you make here? We probably do about a dozen different beers over the year, but we do four on a regular basis. Um, and then the other ones we do is seasonal. So, you know, one year it might be a West Coast IPA, another year it's a big English double IPA. So that part of it changes, but, um, you know, the, the core brand stays in. Right. Last, <laughs> uh, what's your brew house's capacity? Uh, 24 heck. 24 heck? Um, most of our fermenters are 48 heck, uh, or if you're watching this in the U.S., 20 barrel and 40 barrel. Um, we bought the brew house brand new from Preveller Company in uh, Niagara Falls, Ontario. Um, just a great solid piece of equipment. It's worked really well for us over 11 years. And then we've added on the fermenters. So we started out with you know, these couple of dish bottom, with the uh, redwood cladding on them for looks. We're the third owner of those, and those were our fermenters. And we thought, wow, these are, these are big tanks. This is a lot of beer. And now we've got some 40 barrel fermenters in here, and we're looking at the 20s and going, Wow, how did we ever get along with those little bitty tanks? <laughs> so it's been a big shift over 11 years. And I, I did notice one other thing. Today when I went online to get the phone number in case we got lost, <laughs> your website's changed. Yes, yes. It's uh, under redevelopment and reconstruction. So if you haven't been there lately, go take a look. There's some new stuff on there. It looks really nice too. Alrighty, so talking about the beer market, how has the Buffalo beer market changed since you guys? Well, a lot, especially in the last two years. Um, the beer 
the stores that sell beer in uh, Western New York in particular have really awakened to the craft and import revolution that hit the rest of the country 12, 15, 25 years ago. Um, we've got grocery stores here that have gone from beer departments that were one or two small coolers, huge grocery store, two small beer coolers. Now they've got the whole back wall of the grocery store is beer. Um, it's a tremendous selection. And then the home distributor style beer stores here in Western New York, it's called Consumer Beverages, uh, has really come on with a strong craft program. There's stores, when you walk in the front door, there's big stacks of whatever seasonal, you know, if it's Oktoberfest, there's six or eight um, different Oktoberfest beers that make up that stack. So that's, that's your real impact uh, when you walk in the store. So people have really awakened in Western New York to the craft beer revolution. And what factors do you think have attributed to the entire national American beer explosion? I, I think it's just awareness. It's as one, one brewer opens up in an area, um, then another brewer opens up in that area, then people become a little more aware of beer, so they start trying it, and they try it, they like it, they buy it. It's just, it's that real organic growth. Um, now in, in Buffalo, there's there's not a second brewery that's open since since we've been here. So it's just, it's a lot of street hustle on our part. Um, we've got a distributor in, in the Western New York area that's been really good to work with, and that's very unusual for craft beer. They usually talk about you know how tough it is to work with their distributor and, and how hard they are, and they try and shelve the brand. And uh, Triad Distributing here in Western New York has been exactly the opposite. They've been real helpful. Uh, I could walk in there right now and go talk to pretty much anybody and work out anything that we need to work out. Alrighty, I've read, I've read online that uh, sales of craft beer here in the U.S. has risen by 10%. What do you think is attributed to that? Uh, I, well, we've kind of rolled over a generation since the craft beer movement has started. Now, my sons are 24 and 27 years old. And from the time that they were little kids, other than the fact that their dad made beer, if they went into a store, there was always a selection of brands of beer, a selection of styles of beer. Now at six and seven years old, I don't think they were that aware of what was on the store shelf, but it's just something that's always been available. Where that wasn't true, people my age, the tender young age of 53, uh, you know, I grew up around basically one style of beer, the Bud Miller, Michelob, Golden Molson Labatt's, yeah, whatever. The, the yellow watered down beer. That was the style of beer. And now when you walk into a grocery store, you, know, you can find anything. And grocery stores is where most people buy their beer in Western New York. I so wish I could go to a grocery store and buy my beer. I'll drive you there. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know how many craft breweries there are in New York State? Uh, about 50, 52. Okay, because that goes on to my next question. Yeah. In 1984, Ontario's first modern-day craft brewery opened, The Brick, which okay. you can still consider craft, even though they're sort of not. But since then, we've, we've hit maybe 35, right. 27 years. What do you think possibly would have to change in our market to let us somewhat try to catch up to the American market? I, I think uh, loosen up on the brew pub issue. Um, a lot of the craft breweries that we have in New York State are brew pubs or started as brew pubs. Our initial thought was that Flying Bison would be a brew pub. And uh, fortunately for the consumer, unfortunately for the people who work at brew pub, uh, in Erie County, where we are, around Buffalo, the license allows them to stay open till 4 a.m. It's tough to be there till four, count out your money, go home, get a good night's sleep, and be back by seven to start the boiler and start mashing in. So a little too much. So we took off the restaurant part of it and uh, that makes it harder to get going. Where with a brew pub, if somebody comes in and orders a sandwich or a pint of beer, you know, you're keeping all that money. Where, you know, I've got to brew it, get it to a bar or restaurant, get them to sell it, and then the money comes in. So it's just, it's, it's a little farther off. With the growth of craft brew, you're now seeing the big guys getting a little smarter and coming along with pseudo craft breweries. Sure. And craft breweries. 
Now, personally for me, I, I look at it two ways. I look at it as something good because it's going to get the masses right. to start drinking beer that sort of tastes better. Right. And then I find it can be bad because it's taking away from sales of good beer. How, yeah. do, how do you feel about this? Yeah, um, there's there's two sides to it, and I and I understand both sides. Um, but I like the fact that they're doing it. Um, I hate seeing the amount of say Blue Moon that we see on a on a stack in Western New York. But on the other hand, anybody that's drinking Blue Moon was a former you know, Milk Ultra or Coors Light or Bud Light Lime drinker that's become just a tiny little bit more adventurous and. It Blue Moon has become a little more adventurous in their marketing and they're putting Belgian ale on there where up until fairly recently ale was a dirty word. You know, it was, oh, ale, it's thick, it's dark, it's strong, it's heavy, ah, we're all gonna die. Um, but it's not that way. Um, so they're at least trying it and while, you know, I'm not too happy with those beers and, and I don't care for them, I don't think they're very flavorful or very authentic for style. It's at least getting people to talk about something a little more beer-like. It's, it, it's very true. And uh, how has the New York State Brewing Association changed the beer market? Well, I think awareness is probably the biggest thing. Uh, we put on beer festivals and uh, work together with other brewers in the area to do beer festivals, organize events, to come up with a set of you know, we can't just do every event where someone says, hey, can you come in and donate free beer and do this whatever event? Uh, we've agreed that there are certain ones that we just can't do. You know, if it has something to do with a school or kids or kids sports, you really can't because sooner or later somebody's gonna come out and say, ah, they're marketing alcohol to children. Um, and we can't ever get hung with that tag. So we, you know, we've done that, but the awareness, the willingness to work together you know, if you're putting on a beer festival, I'll come to your beer festival, then you come to my beer festival, and it, it works out. Even though you don't distribute in that area, you do it as a, as a brotherly support kind of thing. I see, this wasn't ever going to be part of this, but since we're talking about marketing beer to children, anybody other than me think that the Bud Light line box and label looks like it's meant for kids? How about Shock Top? Even more, <laughs> yeah, the mobile It looks like a Sesame Street character. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> What is your distribution region? Um, Erie and Niagara County. So Buffalo, New York, and Niagara Falls. That's it. Ready? I, I have seen pictures of your new truck, so I take it you do do direct delivery? No, that's actually, that truck is owned by the distributor. Oh. And part where I was talking about how great they are to work with, we split the cost on having the artwork put on that truck. So, you know, it. It allows us to get into something that we can never do on our own. Just the cost of that truck, and between owning the truck, putting gas in the truck, and then putting that artwork in the truck, we couldn't do on our own. Well, they own the truck, they put the gas in the truck, and we split the cost of the artwork on the truck. So all of a sudden, this is a really good idea. That actually sounds really good. <laughs> in New York State, what avenues do you have to sell your beer? In, like in, in Ontario, we have the LCBO, right. the retail store, the brewery, and the licensee, and that's the best. Okay. In, in New York State, when you open up as a distributing brewery, you can get a permit to be self-distributing, and that's what we did. Uh, some states resist that because of the three-tier system left over from Prohibition, but in New York State, it's allowed. So we did that, and that allows you to get out there and grow to the point where you get big enough and important enough that a distributor is interested in you. Um, and then you can start that relationship with the distributor. And then once you start that relationship, that really helps you grow. Now, they can get you into the grocery store, restaurant, bar, tavern, and the on-premise license, uh, convenience store, um, the home distributor store, beer store. Um, so we have all those different avenues that can sell beer and we didn't necessarily see growth in that until said, sort of the magic two years ago. Now all of a sudden we're in convenience stores, we're in the baseball park, so we're starting to see as, as our name gets a little better known, we're getting into more and more and more places. Do the big guys make it hard to find somebody to carry craft here? 
Um, they, they do just by their presence. Uh, Anheuser-Busch had a corporate policy called the 100% share of mine about five, six years ago they came out with this. Uh, maybe a little longer than that. Time flies when I'm having fun, you know. Um, where they said, hey, you distributors, you must spend your time thinking about Anheuser-Busch and Anheuser-Busch products. They don't have that policy formally anymore, but just by their sheer size, a distributor looks at it and says, I can spend 10 minutes walking to a grocery store, I say Budweiser, and everybody knows what I'm talking about. I can say Flying Bison, and everybody says, what? So the grocery store is more likely to build a huge display of Budweiser, sell that huge display of Budweiser, and even though the distributor makes less money per unit, they make a lot of money because they sell billions of units. So it's it's not that they're coming out chasing us, but uh, they do make a hard on the size of theirs. Alrighty, and do you have to do anything to get into any stores, or is it all the distributors? A distributor can put you in there all on their own, and they they do that with import brands and, and uh, small brands that are from outside the area. Um, the fact that I can walk into a Wegmans grocery store, a Topps grocery store, meet the manager, talk with the store employees, talk about the beer, um, we'll have them over and do a tasting and a tour. Um, you know, the distributor might get us in, but we can help drive the volume. Right. So I know, I know in Ontario, or say the LCBOs, it's it's a government-ran entity, but it's like each store is a franchise. So once you get it in, you have to go to each store and make them right. want to take your beer in. So yeah, you, you actually have your distribution a little bit easier that way. Right. That's that's for sure. And we are allowed to do samplings in the grocery store. And the grocery stores, when that law was passed about two three years ago, really resisted that idea of oh people are going to come in, they're going to be drunk, they're going to be staggering around, you know, giving each other rides in the shopping carts. We're not going to do that. And now, any weekend that I'm avail available, a grocery store wants me to do a tasting in their store because they know it helps sell beer. And there have been no responsibility issues. Alrighty, and uh, on the licensee level, do you have any problems with big guys? Uh, like in, in Ontario, big guys, Molson and all that, do like to try and strong arm some of the bar owners into not having craft beer on taps, buying their tap equipment for them, stuff like that. We're not allowed to do that sort of pay-for-play in New York State, um, although it does exist. You know, we're not allowed to give them anything of value, and it's up to the New York State Liquor Authority to decide what of value means. Um, the big breweries can bring in a neon light for the window, and bar owners are just in love with neon lights. Um, Maybe not the bar owners love neon lights. <laughs> I, I don't know anybody who is driving down the street and says, hey, wow, that bar has Labatt's, let's go in. Um, you know, so the neon light just lets you know that's a bar. There's lots of other ways they can find that out. So there's a certain amount of that that the big breweries try and do, but it can only be successful to a certain point. You've got to be on draft in that bar. You've got to sell in order for the bar owner to keep you on. Um, so that's... You know, the great equalizer is the customer. Uh, if the customers go in and they order Flying Bison beer instead of Budweiser, then certainly we're going to get a second tap of Budweiser. Alrighty, and lastly for distribution. Is it difficult to distribute to other states or even to cross the border into Canada? It's very difficult to cross the border into Canada because now we've got to start dealing with a whole different federal government plus LCBO plus your store plus all those issues that you're all too well aware of. Um, to cross from one state to another, you've got to find out what their liquor laws are, apply to their state liquor authority, and then work within those laws to try and get your beer in and distribute it. Alrighty, the big questions, the ones that everybody wants to know. What does craft beer mean? What does craft beer mean? Craft beer means it's made with love. Um, and I mean, that, that's kind of true. There are craft breweries that are making styles like cream ale, where they're putting a little rice in, or they're trying to make uh, kind of prohibition era lagers where they're putting a little corn in. 
those are no less legitimate than our, you know, Aviator Red, which is made with all malted barley. Um, so I, I think it's the attitude of the brewer and the brewery that we brew our beer to be flavorful and drinkable, and the, the big breweries brew their beer to be profitable. And I think that's the difference. Alrighty, and another question you hear all the time, why is there a difference in price? Because the ingredients we use are so much more expensive. Uh, corn and you know, pearled rice and, and corn grits, uh, corn sugar are a lot less expensive than premium two-row malted barley. And the other one is we buy our things in much smaller quantities. Yeah, they. You they look at the way the price scale. per pound go. Oh my goodness, yeah. Six pack for you compared to a six pack for them. Yeah. Well, before we partnered with Matt Brewing Company, um, we were paying around $21 a pound for hops. Same hops, same contract, you know, we're paying a lot less than that. Ouch. Yeah, that's yeah, a big option. It's when you want to buy your own field to start growing it. <laughs> Alrighty, other than coloring, which some people know goes with the big brand here, yeah. corn, rice, what other types of things are put into the big brands compared to what isn't put into the small? Um, well, a lot of the big breweries use something called a heading agent. When you take out some malted barley and you put in rice or corn, you're taking out some of the protein that helps build foam. And you take out some of the hops and jack up your CO2 level to simulate hop bitterness. You're taking out some of those tetra compounds that bind the proteins together to build a nice creamy rocky foam. So now you've got less foam. So they'll put in heading agents that can be anything from albumin to propylene glycol. What I want to drink. Mmm. Big glass of antifreeze. Yes. Uh, is there a difference in shelf life? Um, it's not so much the size of the brewery that makes that, but how you filter and uh, whether or not you pasteurize. Some of the medium sized breweries are starting to pasteurize because they know their beer ship, being shipped farther distances. They know that it's sitting warm on the shelf. They know, you know, there's a certain amount of abuse that, that's going to take place upon that poor, unsuspecting beer. So they're, they're starting to, to find ways to pasteurize their beer. Whether it's to partner with a bigger brewery and ship some of their beer there to get pasteurized or to get brewed there and then pasteurized. Um, so yeah, shelf life, uh, there, there is a big difference. The smaller the brewery, usually the shorter the shelf life. And the way that a lot of the smaller breweries have started to combat that is to come up with things that are bigger alcohol beers. Seven, eight, nine, ten percent ABV beers that can stand up to six months on the shelf. And I know, I know one of my our good buddies there has an experiment going on. He has a six pack in his basement. I'm oh, sorry, a two four in his basement. Yeah. One of the big brands. And once a year, he drinks one of those bottles. Oh yeah. To see how it is. It's like he says he's up to six years now. It's still pretty good. Wow. But he would never go near his beer after six years. Right. Right. The only thing we've ever done that that we've ever, not so much encouraged, but even allowed anyone to, to store, lay down, keep, is uh, a barley wine that we make that's 9.5%. Barley wine. You like barley wine. All right, do you feel not having the scientific department that some of the big guys have to edit their crops to make them make that say hurts the brewery? Um, it could potentially, but you've got to kind of live within your means. We only distribute a very small area. We work with one distributor. We know what our distributor's going to do. We know what the stores are going to do. Um, so we've, we've got that going for us. We only deal with certain malting companies because we know what the quality of that malt is going to be. So we do have a lab. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles that a big lab has. But we do have a lot where we can do some quality control and then some quality assurance. Um, and then, again, our partnership with Matt Brewing Company, we can drive stuff down there and drop it off, have a meeting, and a couple days later get the lab results. So that helps us stay out in front of everything. But the, the biggest thing that breweries could do is to know your malt supplier, uh, control your water, and be very careful with the brewing process, and then you can head off a lot of those problems that might happen down the line. Now, even though the end result from the big guys and the smaller guys isn't even close to the same, is the process in between pretty much the same? 
Well, there are things like filtering. They filter, we filter. We filter to about five microns to take out visible yeast and protein. They, they filter down to sterile. They'll strip out color. They can strip out flavor and then add that back in later um, for some of the aforementioned compounds. Um, so, I mean, they have a mash ton, we have a mash ton, but they have a cereal cooker before it and then more scientific controls and probably a filter between cereal cooker and mash ton. And they have a kettle and we have a kettle. We use uh, whole hop pellets. Uh, they'll use hop extracts. You know, um, so yeah, it's the same process, but no, not really. You know, right. for every step we have, they have probably a secondary part of that step. Do you feel the amount of craft breweries hurts the craft brewery movement, or is it helping? I think for the most part it's helping. Not every craft brewery is doing the bang up job you would like them to do. Um, there are some people who get into it just because they, they want to. It doesn't mean that they've studied, it doesn't mean that they can brew a great beer. And the funny part is, no matter what country you're in, as part of all the licensing paperwork you have to go through and all the permitting process you have to go through, nobody ever comes up to you and goes, hey, buddy, really know how to make beer? Nobody ever asks you that. So, you know, there are some people out there who are making beer that I would not be proud to put on the street. Um, so that part can hurt you. But for every brewery that's out there that's making a good glass of beer, that actually helps you. Because for people who have a positive experience at Wellington County, and they come over to the border and go, hey, there's a little brewery in Buffalo. I'll go there. I think their beer will be good, too. Ready? Do you know of many craft breweries that practice one of the, the my most hated at least, big brewery concept, which is, High gravity water cut here. No, I don't know any small breweries that are doing that. I've been to a lot, so. <laughs> no one can hear what you're saying. That, that's fine. They, don't <laughs> they know exactly what you're saying. Don't do it. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's always better if you if you can not do it, but if you have a small brew house and you're able to get some large fermenters, I can see where the temptation would be to do that. Um, it's not a practice I would like to use. No, I, I was just asking because I've found a couple now that have done it, not not to the big brewery yeah. standards, maybe like five hex extra, but right. still, I, I just wanted to know. What, yeah. And lastly, do you think that the amount of recognized styles right now might scare some people away from leaving their golden lovers. Um, I think we can be an intimidating industry for people to come into for the first time. When they, if they were to walk into a store that had only craft beer and they were used to a light North American golden lager, I can see where they might be a little intimidated. But as long as there's a friendly face who comes up and you know, kind of. Put, Hey, come on, let me show you something that I think you're going to like just fine. Um, I think as long as we're good ambassadors for the industry, I think it's the opposite. I think we'll, we'll make it easier for them to get off of the, the bulk of North America. I just wish we could get some of the stores that you guys have down here. I walked into the Village Beer Merchant. Oh, yeah. I was here. Yep. First, anybody that hasn't been there should go. Just a huge, well, small store, but just line after line of single bottles. Now, the thing I love about shopping for beer down here is you can pick up every bottle, mm -hmm. read every bottle, look at it. And just like you said, a friendly face came up and greeted me. He recognized me. And his me name was Vinny. And he, <laughs> he recognized me from the internet. He said, You probably would like this beer. It came in just yesterday. Yeah. And as soon as he walked away, I grabbed the one right beside it. He goes, You know, if you watched me, you should have known I wouldn't touch the double IPA. But <laughs> that's the one thing I love about down here. But anyway, thank you very much for your time. Oh, cheers. Great. Thanks for coming by. Uh, thank you. Come by for a visit anytime.